Simply, Prabhupada is giving the real distinguishing factor between bhakti yoga and other forms of personal elevation. Bhakti yoga is especially meant for satisfying our vision, whereas other methods of elevation, such as karma and yoga, they are all full of selfish desires. The karmis who want to satisfy themselves. Gyanis also, in the, in the more subtle way, and the yogis also, in, not in a directly gross way. Now I may say also the karmis, that there is, you may find selfless people. You may find people who are also not trying to satisfy their senses, their other selves directly, but they're trying to help others. It's like we have so many welfare workers who dedicate their lives for the benefit of others. Or we have people who dedicate their lives for the benefit of their country. Just like the great English Prime Minister, he said, he said, William Pitt, when he was leaving his body, he is purported to have said, my country, how I leave my country. So he was thinking, about his country. So are these not also selfless people? Someone who goes onto the battlefield and gives his life for the service of his country, is he not selfless? So some factor of selflessness may be there, but because it's all centered on the wrong object, it's all useless. Just like if you work hard, but you don't know how to work properly, then it's all useless. You may work hard to build a building, but if you don't know how to build a building properly, it may fall down very soon. But in Calcutta, sometimes you see, you build a building, but it's built so badly, isn't it? And there's a bit, not only in Calcutta, I saw even in Croatia, people, they build their own houses. They don't. They want to save money, but they don't know how to do it. So after some time, it will fall down. Not build properly. I have to speak to even our Oniskan Guru called in another building. It's not built properly, so it's less than 20 years old and it's all falling to pieces. So we, a lot of hard work went into it, but it was all not done properly. So there's no power in effect. So in the same way, we have to know not only selflessness, of course that's not even selflessness, to work for your country, that's also, how about used to explain that, extended selfishness. Why, why does someone work for the benefit of others? Because he also gets some pleasure. It's like they have the idea, you should help others. Let us feed others. So to feed other, they feed other human beings, and they kill animals to feed them. So it's not sarva bhuta hite ratam. It's not working for the benefit of all living beings, but it's, perhaps there's some idea that I should work for the, not for, not for the benefit of all living beings, but some idea, let me help all human beings. But they don't know that the animals, they're also living beings. There's no qualitative difference to an animal and a human being, they're all spirit, soul, part and parcel of God. So if you want to benefit the human beings at the expense of other living beings, then you're also, you think you're doing them good, but you're not. Just like if you think, I'll feed the hungry people by killing the animals, then you're causing suffering to the animals and you're giving bad karma to the human beings, you're not actually benefiting them. If you feed a human being with meat, then you may think, I'm benefiting him, but actually you're sending him to hell. So you, you don't know how you're doing it. You don't know how to benefit others. And similarly, nationalism, you get the feeling that I, I'm a great nationalist. You get, it's a selfish feeling. I shall, I shall become famous as a nationalist, or I shall do good for my country. Get 
it's a selfish feeling. Plus it's all useless anyway. What's, you, you, you give your life for your country. What is the benefit of that? Your country, you may give your life for your country, but your country may not exist after some time. Just like uh, people that now they're fighting Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, they're all fighting each other. But these borders of these countries, they've changed so many times. You are fighting for Croatia, and after some time there won't be any Croatia, it will be some other country will come and take it over. There won't be any such country. But the border will change. So what is the, what is the meaning? It's meaningless. So all these different classes of people, even though they may appear to be selfless, they're actually selfish, extended selfishness. And they cannot, you cannot achieve actual satisfaction. Krishna Bhakta Nishkam Dev Shanta Bhakti Mukti Shiti Gami Shakti Asham. Chitana Mahaprabhu has analyzed. Only the devotee is peaceful in his heart because only he is free from material desire. And everyone else, Bhukti Mukti Shiti Gami. Bhukti Gami means someone who wants sense enjoyment, karmis. Those who want liberation, jnanis. Those who want mystic power, yogis, they're all dissatisfied because they always want something. They're not satisfied. But the devotee wasn't and doesn't want anything. This particularly refers to pure devotees, those who have taken up pure devotional service, because even others they may be devotees, but they are coming with the idea, let me also enjoy the material world, or let me get mukti. This is called karma mishra bhakti or jnana mishra bhakti. Where one is performing devotional service with the idea that I, yeah, I'm worshiping God, but I also want to enjoy the material world. That's karma mishra bhakti. Or jnana mishra bhakti. I'm worshiping Krishna, but I have something that I give. I will get mukti. For all my endeavors, I will get some benefit. But the pure devotee, especially those in the line of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, especially those in this world, they are interested only how to serve Krishna without anything in return. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Nadhanam, Nadhanam, Nasundaram, Kamitam Bha, Jagadi, Shikhani, Baba Janmani, Janmani, Shvari, Bhavatan, Bhakti, Rahayati, Kintani. He says, I don't want money. I'm not worshipping you for money. Mostly people go to God for money. Or I don't want to become famous as a great leader of so many materialistic people. Nadhanam, Nasundaram, I'm not coming asking for a beautiful word. Kamitam Bha, Jagadi, Shikhani. Even anything, Attainable in the material world. I'm not asking for that. Then everyone goes to God with some prayer. So what what is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu praying for? Is he asking for mukti? That also, because he says, Mama Janmani Janmani, I may have many births. What does he want? Bhavatad Bhampira Haitikitu. Let there be unmotivated devotional service to you. Unmotivated, no personal desire. Just like we've heard that Mother Yashoda, if she sees one little drop of sweat, perspiration on Krishna's forehead, so that little inconvenience to remove, she is prepared to go to hell for millions of years. Let Krishna be satisfied. Let, I don't mind, I may, I may suffer. We also know the story of the gopis, how they wanted to cure Krishna's headache. Krishna was, this is all leela, God doesn't get headaches, but anyway, he may get just to increase his leela, to increase the loving exchange between himself and his devotees. So one day now, Muni came to Krishna, and he saw Krishna looks a little disturbed, so after offering obeisances and prayers, he asked, what is your condition? So he said, actually I have a headache. So now Muni, being a devotee, he wanted to know, how to cure that headache? How can we cure it? Shall I bring some medicine? Krishna said, yeah. I've, I've analyzed, I've diagnosed, the only medicine I need, the dust from my devotee's feet. So now I've only thought, all right, I'll go get some. Because he didn't think I'm a devotee. The devotee doesn't think I'm a devotee. So he went to find some devotees. So he went, to, first of all, to Brahmaji. And after all the formalities of the Yes. And I need some dust from your lotus feet. 
to cure the headache of Krishna, we have to put on his head. Brahma said, what are you talking about? Brahma, I am Brahma, I am the son of Narayana. I can't put, it's completely against all rules and regulations. I'm, I'm teaching the rules and regulations of the Vedas and human society. If I go against them, how can anyone know? Sorry, please help me out. Then you went to Lord Shiva and got a similar response. You went to so many devotees and got such a response. And when you went to the gopis, the gopis they said, Oh, Narad Muni, you're a great devotee of Krishna. Did you see Krishna recently? So he said, Yes. So what is Krishna doing? He said, How is he? Is everything all right with him? Narad Muni said, well, Actually, there's some problem. The gopis became very upset. What? What problem? Actually, Krishna has a headache. Oh, the gopis became very sad. Then how? What to do? And now everyone is said, well, actually there's one cure. We have to take dust from the devotees, so to speak, to put on Krishna's head. Krishna told me that's the only cure. So please, if you can give me some dust from your feet, I'll take and put on Krishna's head. So the gopis immediately said, yes, yes, take immediately. This is going to cure Krishna's headache. Immediately take. Take as much as you want. Then Narad Muni said, Well, are you afraid of going to hell? Tell me no. Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. If you put the dust from your feet on his head, you have to go to hell. It's a great offense. Gopi said, Really? Anyway, never mind. Are you afraid of going to hell? No, all right, we'll go to hell, doesn't it? But we have to cure Krishna's headache. So this is the attitude of the pure devotees. The gopis, they are the ideal example. They never wanted anything from Krishna. They only wanted to serve Krishna without anything in return. This attitude has been idealized in the other prayer of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. As nishyava padaratam punashtu amadarshanam namahatam karotu bhat yata tata ava vidhupatu vidhupatu lambhato at prananathas In the mood of Srimati Radhika, Lord Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was praying that my dear Lord Krishna, as far as I'm concerned, my happiness is if I can be with you. So if you like, you can make me happy. By embracing you. Or, if somehow or other it gives you pleasure, then don't show yourself to me. I won't see. I'll be unhappy, you'll be happy. Anyway, what can I expect from you, Krishna? Your Lampart means debauching. We don't know what we're going to do next. We can't trust you at all. But anyway, whatever, whatever you are, whoever you are, you are the worshipful Lord of my life. Whatever you do to me, you see so sweet in the to Whoever you are, whatever you are, you are the Lord of my life. So this is the selfless attitude. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came especially to teach us the highest level of devotion. The highest level of devotion, it is not, that is especially that which is taught, that is taught by their very lives by the gopis of Vrindavan. Ramya kachit ipasana vajjana dhenu bhagam yakauti. As Chaitanya Mahaprabhu taught, that the best mode of worship, Aradya Bhagavan Vajayashitanya Tadham Vrindavan. The Supreme Personality of God is Lord Sri Krishna. He is the topmost worshipable person. And similarly, as he is worshipable, so is Dham, Vrindavan. That is also worship. And who are the topmost devotees? That what is the ideal of devotion? That is the gopis of Vrindavan. So we are not simply talking about that, but actually we are being trained in that. Krishna conscious in the line of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. It is training in selflessness. Of course, the stage of the gopis. That is very, very high. Very, very high. You can understand the attitude of the gopis. Very, very high concept. But the idea is there 
we're being trained in such an idea that the whole training in Krishna consciousness in the mind of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is how to become selfless, not to want anything for ourselves, but only to act for the satisfaction of Krishna. That is the whole idea. Many times people ask, just like last night, again and again they were asking the same question. Can we have spiritual life and material life? Because people think you have to become a sannyasi, you have to give everything up to take the spiritual life. That's not actually the point in the household of life. One can also practice Krishna consciousness. But people can't understand that because generally household life means selfishness. You live for the satisfaction of your senses and you, you're trying to benefit your family and get money and it's selfish. It's the, the principle of family life is group selfishness. The, everyone works together to, to help each other. But the, the basic principle is <coughs> how we can all live very comfortably together. So people can't understand how you can have family life and spiritual life because the two seem to be opposite. But the point is that Krishna consciousness, especially that talk of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, is so powerful training in selflessness that even in family life, if one actually follows the Krishna conscious principles, and even in family life, one develops the attitude of selflessness. Just like here, everyone likes to have a nice apartment and a nice home and their privacy. But if you turn your apartment into the temple of Krishna, where everyone comes, well, that's uh, the ideal use. If someone thinks that this is a, everyone gets a nice apartment so I can enjoy sense gratification in my home. But instead, now, if we open up the home, that everyone come and chant Hare Krishna, then that's the ideal. Actually, we has to live traditionally it's even according to the Vedic rules and regulations, even in karma kind of what to speak of, or feel. There are certain regulations to check that selfish tendency. Otherwise, if one becomes completely selfish, as the modern age, there's no training how to become selfless. Rather, the training is to become completely selfish. So, in the Vedic system, he had such a thing that he has to, he cannot eat without going up after cooking. Actually, the food should be offered to Krishna. That also puts the center on Lord Vishnu, people worship Shalagam Shiva. Anyway, after cooking, before he could eat, you'd have to go on, on the road and call. And he, is there any hungry person? Please come and eat. Prabhupada himself mentioned even Father living in a big city. Every day they would have these three guests. They have some take the sun and they do it. One should not simply cook and eat for himself, but they should distribute to others. So the Vedic culture trains us not to live only for ourselves, it trains us in response at least we should be responsible to others. Respond we should also think of others. And ultimately the ultimate point is to come to the level of satisfying Lord Vishnu, by which we can also be satisfied. We cannot be satisfied by trying to satisfy ourselves. It doesn't work. It's just, this is scientific fact. If you try to satisfy yourself, you won't be satisfied. But if you try to satisfy Krishna, then you'll be satisfied. It's just, as you say, scientific fact means because what is our position? Our position is the very Sarupoi Krishna and the Kodas. We are the eternal servant of Krishna. So, if we try to act outside of that concept, we cannot be satisfied. Just like the fish out of water cannot be satisfied. Whatever you do, if you give a fish money, clothes, so many things, the fish won't be satisfied. There's nothing you can do to a fish to make him happy. As long as he's outside the water. As soon as you put him inside the water, then again he feels 
carefully, feel satisfied. So in the same way, there's nothing we can do to try to satisfy ourselves independently of Krishna. But if we simply try to satisfy Krishna, then automatically we become satisfied. Anything outside of the concept of trying to satisfy Lord Vishnu is useless, simply a waste of time. And then again, Savai Pong Sang Paro Dhan Therefore, actual religion, the actual standard of religion, is to act in such a way, without any personal desire, simply how can we satisfy our mission? And if we do this all the time, our whole life is dedicated simply to satisfy our mission, then we also become satisfied. This is the secret. People are trying to be happy, but they don't know. They're thinking we should be happy by sense gratification. But what happens? They don't get satisfied. So they try to do, they think, let us do more sense gratification. It is point I think. And why do people have problems? Because they're not having points. So in traditional society, there are so many rules and regulations. Don't do this, don't do this. Don't just have a male, female. In marriage only, don't do outside of that. So quite out. these are all restrictions, and because of these restrictions, we're not satisfied. These are artificial. So remove all restrictions. So they did in the Western countries. They removed all restrictions. The people did not become satisfied. They became more dissatisfied. So Freud's idea is that if you have any dissatisfaction, the reason is because that you're not having enough sex in it. It's Freud's idea. You should have more and more.